Hey everybody, it's Jose Riesco, Deacon and Pastoral Intern at MPI Dallas Church. So excited to be here. Uh, great honor it is for me to be here when Pastor Joe asked me to preach for this chapel service. I almost started crying. I was driving and I had to start worshiping the Lord. It was just brought a great presence of God with me. I'm so honored to be here, so excited. I don't deserve to be here. I think about when Paul said I was a blasphemer, a violent man, but God was gracious to me and I can share a similar testimony. Uh, so thanks to all the saints that will be listening to it. I hope you get encouraged. If you're not saved, I hope you get saved here in this. And Pastor Joe and all the, the leadership of Legacy Ministry College, thank you so much for having me. It's just a great honor to be on here, especially with uh, all these brothers and sisters I look up to. Uh, Pastor Joe, Pastor Troy, my, uh, our sister, our Pastor Lauren, Jared, Berto, all, all the mighty men and women of God from uh, um, from Legacy Ministry College. It's an honor to share this platform with you. So. I just want y'all to know that we're very honored. It's just, it's, it's amazing. I, 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 I couldn't even imagine. It was a great desire for me to preach here, but it's like a dream come true. Amen. So um, when I was praying, I really felt the Lord to share on Acts 1 and Acts 2, the Pentecostal heritage. Get this point of view before we even get into the scriptures. The first church was Pentecostal. They didn't go around saying, hey, we're Pentecostal, y'all Reformed, y'all Baptist. Everybody was Pentecostal, my friends. Everybody was speaking in tongues, or at least a lot of people, right? Uh, most of them were speaking in tongues, believing it at least, uh, laying hands on people, healing the sick, casting out demons, preaching the gospel boldly, seeing great multitudes saved and discipling the nations. Uh, so you didn't have to ask them, hey, are you guys, uh, hey, Paul and James, are you guys Pentecostals or are you guys Reformed? What are y'all? They were, everybody was filled with the Holy Ghost, or like I said, at least most of them, right? Uh, so be encouraged. You know, the first church was uh, uh, marked by this Holy Ghost fire. And think about it, you don't even have a recorded sermon from any disciples until they got filled with the Holy Ghost. Okay, you don't hear any of Peter's sermons until you got filled with the Holy Ghost. So without further ado... Um, let us get into the Word of God, into Acts chapter 1. Luke writing, In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach. Okay, look at what look at what Luke is saying. All that Jesus began to do and to teach. It reminds me of that verse where Paul says, Watch your life and your doctrine closely. Okay, it's life and doctrine that we need to have in order. Not one or the other. Both. Let's have our life in order and our doctrine in order. Amen. Verse 2. Until that day he was taken up to heaven. After giving instructions to the Holy Spirit, to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, come on, we got to suffer. He presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. Come on. What was Jesus talking about after he resurrected was he talking about sports <laughs> you know five ways to live your best life now i mean he was talking about the kingdom of god 40 days after resurrection he proved to them that he was alive and he spoke about the kingdom of god let that be our testimony that hey after i've been resurrected after i've been saved with jesus by jesus christ and the holy ghost power through the father all i talk about is jesus that's it. I talk about the kingdom of God. That's all that's going to matter in the end. What we do for God's kingdom. Let us preach about God's kingdom. See, and the people who, who even Christians who would say, I don't want to preach that much, or y'all taking it too serious with the discipleship, or laying down your lives for Jesus. Well, guess what? Everybody's preaching something. Aren't you talking about something? That's your gospel. Aren't you making disciples for someone? I mean, if you work at McDonald's, don't you make disciples for McDonald's? Don't you want the other McDonald's employees to do what McDonald's wants you to do? Do I walk into McDonald's and say, hey, I'm going to teach y'all how to flip burgers like we do in Burger King? I mean, you're getting kicked out of the job if you keep that up. You get what I'm saying? And my family, I want my kids to act like me. Don't you? Don't I? Don't you do the same thing? Everybody's preaching. Everybody's making disciples. And finally, everybody's dying. So I don't want to die for Jesus, someone might tell you. Okay, you don't have to. But you're still going to die for someone or something might as well serve the Lord. It only makes logical sense. It's stupid. It's irrational not to serve Jesus, not to preach his gospel and make disciples and die for him. Because you're going to do it either way. Be wise. Fear God and do it for Jesus. Come on. Verse 4. Look at this. I love this verse, and I like to bring this up to a lot of people who deny the baptism of the Holy Ghost. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Hear me out. Hear, or hear him out better. 
He gave them a command. Should we go back? Uh, let us go back to Matthew 20, 18 and 20. You don't have to go there in the scriptures. But let us go back there real quick. He says to teach them everything I've commanded. Okay? So if Jesus commanded it, should we teach it and should we do it? Yes. Everyone say yes. So we should do everything Jesus commanded us to do. What does he command here in verse 4? Let's see what it keeps going on to say. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So every disciple of Christ is commanded to teach others to wait for the promised Holy Ghost. And, and, and you're going to get baptized with fire. Amen. You're going to get baptized in water, yes. But you're also supposed to get baptized in fire. Not for salvation, okay? We're not saying you have to speak in tongues and even get water baptized to be saved. We're saved by faith alone, Ephesians 2, verse 8. We're saved by faith in Jesus Christ alone. It's by faith from the beginning to end, Romans 1, 16. We're not ashamed of the gospel, and it's been by faith from first hand. It's always been by faith from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob until now. It's always been by faith. And after that faith saves you, then you live it out in fear and trembling. And one of those things is, yes, getting water baptized, but also getting fire baptized in the Holy Ghost. This is a command that Jesus gave the early disciples. Verse 6, Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power. When the Holy Ghost comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Come on. They're like, Jesus, you're going to rule the world right now? You're going to take over? You're going to be like David and bust everybody's head and, and give us back, you know, Canaan, give us back the land that our father was, uh, that our father's been promised? And Jesus is like, that ain't your business right now. But in a few days, he says, uh, excuse me, uh, but that's not in your business, he says. But then you'll receive power when the Holy Ghost comes to you. So he's like, that's not in your concern right now. When I'm going to come back and make everything right. But right now, wait for that gift of promised Holy Ghost and go be a witness to the ends of the earth. Come on. That's Pentecostal heritage. We were all called to do that. All of us. You're telling me you, you James and them and Peter are called to that, but you're not? Come on. Now that don't make sense. We're supposed to teach everything that Jesus commanded. Put Acts 1.8. To go get baptized in the Holy Ghost, to be a witness to all the nations, put it together with Mark 16, 15. Go preach the gospel to all creations. In my name, drive out demons, heal the sick, uh, um, pick up sex of your hands, it won't hurt you. And then he says he confirmed this word. Put Look at that. Those two together, they, they, they coincide. Now, put together the end of Matthew 28. Go to uh, uh, go make disciples of all the nations. If you put these last words of Christ together, you get preach the gospel to our creations with miracles, signs, and wonders, and then make disciples of all the nations. Look at this. Look at this. I feel God has showed this to me one time. You get the Old Testament, and it's about this much. Let me get it. Hold on one second. Let me get Matthew. Here's all the Old Testament right here. The shadow of Christ. Here's the gospels. Okay. Here's the book of Acts, 28 chapters. So the, the shadow in the Old Testament, the gospels, the good news about Christ, how to be saved. Here's the book of Acts. They're living out. Listen to me. In, Mar in the book of Acts, you see them living out Mark 16, 15, going to all the world to preach the gospel. You're seeing them live out Matthew 28, 18 and 20, making disciples of all the nations, going to all the nations. You see them living out Acts 1 to 8, witnessing to all the nations. And then what do you get in the letters? What do you get in the letters? Look at this. The new believers getting discipled. <laughs> the Old Testament, the shadow, the Gospels, Jesus coming as a man dying on the cross for our sins, the book of Acts, them living out, the call to go to all the nations, and then the letters, the, uh, the letters uh, discipling and teaching the new believers good li uh, how to live a Christian life and good doctrine. Come on. Discipleship and evangelism and preaching the gospel are two sides of the same coin. One without the other is incomplete. You win somebody to the Lord and you don't disciple them, it's like catching a fish and releasing it back out, uh, back into the sea. You didn't catch the fish. You didn't finish the job. And same thing the other way. You can't disciple someone who's a goat. You can't, you can't shepherd someone who's not a sheep and they're not saved and you're trying to disciple them. Does that make sense? They're two sides of the same coin, okay? We must preach the gospel 
to the lost and then make disciples of them after we win them for the lost. But I feel right now we're going to go through Acts 1 and 2 and you're going to see the foundation of gospel preaching in the lives of the apostles and the early church. So let's continue in verse 9. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. So Christ's last words. Go into all the world to preach the gospel. Go make disciples of all nations. Get filled with the Holy Ghost and be my witness to all the nations. His last words. If I was on my deathbed and I gave you last words and I said, tell my wife and kids I love them. Keep preaching the word of God. Bless them. And, and, and bless them and encourage the church to do the same. And then you go to my wife and kids and you go to my church and you say, hey, Jose, loves you guys. Have a great day. Like, um, yeah, that was nice, but that's not what I said. Does that make sense? Christ's last words were, go into all the world to preach the gospel, miracles, signs, and wonder. Make disciples of all the nations. Be my witness. His last words. We must take these serious, take all his words seriously, but especially, he could have said anything else, right? He could have said, love the poor. Be generous to this per, uh, to the poor. Um, I, you know, I, I don't know. Love your mom and dad. Honor your father and mother. Honor their Sabbath. But what did he say? Preach the gospel to all creation. Make disciples of all nations. Get filled with the Holy Ghost and, and, and do it with miracles, signs, and wonders. Verse 10, <clears throat> they were looking intently up into the sky as he was going when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into this sky? This same Jesus who, was, who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. So like looking in the sky as Jesus goes off into the clouds. And then the two angels like, what y'all waiting for? What y'all doing? He's going to come back. Don't, don't, uh, don't be scared. He's coming back. So be encouraged. He's going to come back just like that. It says just like lightning is visible from the east to the west. When Christ returns, man, all nations are going to see him. All nations are going are to mourn because they've sinned against him. Amen. So be encouraged. Dude. Christ is coming back to make everything right. Come on. Verse 12. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day's walk from the city. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were Peter, John, James, and Andrew, Philip, and Thomas, Bartholomew, uh, excuse me, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. They all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. I love Roman Catholics, but man, this is a slight to y'all. This is a rebuke to y'all. Even Mary had to pray to Jesus, okay? Even Mary was praying to Jesus. Then Mary stand up right here and say, hey, you know what? I'm a co-redemptrix with Christ. You can come to me, and then I'll talk to Jesus, and he'll talk to the Father, and it'll be all good. No, even Mary right here is going to pray to Jesus and soon get baptized in the Holy Ghost. In those days, Peter stood up among the believers, a group numbering about 120, and said, brothers and sisters, the scripture had to be fulfilled in which the Holy Spirit spoke long through, long ago through David concerning Judas, who served as a guide for those who arrested Jesus. He was one of our number and shared in our ministry. With the payment he received for his wickedness, Judas bought a field. There he fell headlong. His body burst open and all his intestines spilled out. Everyone in Jerusalem heard about this, so they called that field in the language a caldema, that is, field of blood. Excuse me. For, said Peter, it is written in the book of Psalms, may, he, may his place be deserted, let there be no one to dwell in it, and may another take his place of leadership. I love what Peter does here. Obviously led by the Holy Ghost. Okay? He ain't giving them your opinion. He's not giving the saints his opinion. He's sharing the word of God. He's seeing the connection of Christ's fulfilling, fulfillment of the Old Testament. He's even seeing how Judas's betrayal was foretold in the book of Psalms. Come on. Come on. And in the next chapter, you're going to see Jesus, or excuse me, you're going to see Peter talking about Jesus, and he brings it in from the Old Testament, my friends. I heard a, I heard a preacher, I would almost say, I don't want to say, almost blasphemously say that the apostles didn't have the scriptures, that they just went by being led by the Spirit. And amen, they were led by the Spirit, but they had the scriptures, okay? What did they go on? They went off the scriptures, being led by the Holy Ghost. So the Pentecostal heritage we see in chapter 1, already, already, we're led by the Holy Ghost. They're about to get baptized, and we're also using the Word of God as our foundation. 
So the word when they try to come at us, oh, you guys are too, you know, like like Joe said, what is it, fruit nuts and uh whatever, like oatmeal or something, right? Like a bag of mixed nuts, all crazy with it. Listen to me, yes, there's some that are like that. But real Pentecostals, we're filled with the Holy Ghost and fire, preaching the gospel, making disciples of the nations, and we use the word of God. Come on, we ain't giving my our opinions, not the good ones, right? We're going off the word of God like Peter did early on. And this is even before Peter gets baptized in the Holy Ghost. You'll see in chapter 2 how he uses the, the Old Testament scriptures. So, yes, they, didn't ha they had the scriptures. Did they have it on their phone? Of course not. Did they, ha did they probably have the scriptures in their back pocket? And Peter's like, yo, James, give me, that, uh, uh, give me that book of Psalms right there. See, they had it in their heart. They had the word of God in their heart. And they understood, like, man, this is what Jesus was talking about. So let's keep going to verse 20, 21. <clears throat> Therefore, it is necessary... To choose one of the men who have been with us the whole time the Lord Jesus was living among us. <clears throat> Beginning from John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us. For one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. Come on, you're going to see in the book of Acts, if you read it, I've counted over a hundred times of them witnessing to lost people, to sinners, to people dead in their transgressions. The book of Acts is a book of action of the apostles empowered by the Holy Ghost. And I've counted, I think, to be exact, I think it was like 112, 113, 114, something like that, times where they preach the gospel to lost people. So at least 100, go do it yourself, go through it. And this really, the book of Acts changed the way I preach. I can, I, I, I can tell you right now, when I, when, when I studied the book of Acts for my class, it changed the way I preached. I saw what I saw in similarities with all of them. They were going out in power. They were preaching the gospel boldly. Um, not once did they say Jesus loves you. Okay, does Jesus love us? Of course, Romans 5 eight says God demonstrated his love for us in this. While we're still sinners, Christ died for us. Uh, John 3.16 says it. But I'm telling you, in the book of Acts, I did not find one place where they, where they thought that was gospel preaching. It was always Jesus died on the cross for your sins, rose again. He's going to judge the world. Something along those lines. Okay, it wasn't always said verbatim like that, but it was those things. It was Jesus died on the cross for your sins. He rose again. Repent and believe this. Believe this or perish. Something along those lines. Again, it wasn't always verbatim, but it was that. That's the gospel. Paul says, what I received, I passed on to you as the first importance, that Christ died on the cross for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was dead, buried, uh, excuse me, yes, that he was dead, buried, raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. So they're saying, according to the scriptures, according to the Old Testament, this is what we tell you. Jesus died on the cross for your sins, rose again. Believe this or perish. He's going to judge the world. Something along the line. That's true gospel preaching, friends. And expect to go out there with miracles, signs, and wonders. Expect that God confirm that word by you healing somebody, by you casting out a demon. It doesn't have to happen all the time. We see later on in the book of Acts where Paul spends a long time debating and even talking to people. It's not always miracles, signs, and wonders, but expect God to use you for that. Amen? Take that shot. If you don't take that shot, you're missing that shot. Guarantee if you don't witness to that person, they are not going to get saved by you preaching. Do you understand? If you don't preach to them, they're not going to get saved by you preaching to them. You need to preach to them. If you don't lay your hands on them, boom, and heal them, God's not going to heal them. Listen, by God's grace, I've seen two people get healed from wheelchairs. One of them, I was preaching in the hood on Grand Division, and some uh, some man was pushing a lady, and I came out there at night to preach. And I was by myself filled with the Holy Ghost and power. And you know how there's, a, if you know their neighbor, a lot of drugs, a lot of gang, it's every very just wicked little corner, like six little corner right there, Grand Division in Monticello. And they came down, I think it was Monticello, coming north towards Grand. And I was just preaching, and I saw this lady come up on a wheelchair, and a man was pushing her. And I just said, in the name of Jesus Christ, get up and walk. Or Jesus Christ, here, just get up and walk. Instantly, boom, she shot up and stood up. And the person who was pushing her, the man that was pushing her, started freaking out and praising God. Okay? So, I mean, I've seen God do miracles like that. Well, there was a, uh, a girl who couldn't walk, and she was in a wheelchair at the school I used to teach at, which was a block away from there I used to teach at. Uh, a Chicago public school right there in the corner. And God told me that girl was going to get healed. So I prayed for her and I told her in class, God said he's going to heal you. Get up and walk. She walked a little bit, ended up getting back in her wheelchair. I ended up not getting like officially in trouble, but like almost getting reprimanded for it. I'm like, she got healed. Or people said stuff about it. I'm like, she got healed. She was walking. Um, it, it, it was funny how they seemed to get upset about it. But anyways, a couple years later, I saw her on Grand and, oh, what is that? Cicero, right across the street from Prosser. And she was walking by herself. Amen. And God hit, fulfilled that word and she was walking. And I was like, man, praise God. God did it. Amen. So the Pentecostal heritage, friends. We're not just talking about some far off. We're literally living it out. We're literally living these things out. 
We're living them out. This should be your testimony. It doesn't have to be every one of them that someone gets healed or something crazy happens. Babe, my goodness, you should have some of them. All right? Amen. Step out in faith. If you don't step out in faith, it ain't going to happen. If Peter don't step on the water, God's not suspending that natural law and having you step on the water. See, what was Peter told when he walked on the water? Did Jesus say, great job. You did awesome. He said, you a little faith. Why did you doubt? Okay? Jesus probably wanted Peter to walk across the whole water with him. Come on. Jesus wants you to walk across the whole water with him. And you imagine James and them when Peter gets back in the boat and, and James might have been like, man, Jesus said, you little faith. I didn't even step out in the boat. I wonder what he's thinking about me. <laughs> so let's not be like that. Amen. Let's step on the water and let's live on the water. Let's keep going. It's verse 21. Therefore, it is necessary to choose one of the men who have been with us the whole time the Lord Jesus was living among us. Oh, excuse me. I read that part. Uh, and he says, we must become a witness with us of this resurrection. Um, excuse me. Verse 23. So they nominated two men, Joseph Cabarabbas, also known as Justice, and Matthias. Then they prayed, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which of these two you have chosen to take over this apostolic ministry, which Judas left to go where he belongs. Then they cast lots, and the lot fell to Matthias. So he was added to the 11 apostles. Notice how God uses them to set order in the church. Before the baptism of the Holy Ghost even comes, what did they do? They get together, they start praying, and they must feel the Holy Ghost telling them, let's set the order. Judas left, get somebody to take his place. See, there's always going to be order in the church. There has to be order in the church. God is not a God of disorder. He's a God of order. Okay, let's do things orderly according to the scriptures and follow our leaders. Chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire to separate and came to rest on each of them. All of them. Come on, each single 120 of them. Boom, 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 fire. Each of them. Each one of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues that the Spirit enabled them. Come on, there was Holy Ghost fire for this person. I heard Ryan Habanke say, man, God had a fire for everybody. See, God's got his own fire for everybody. There's enough for everybody. Come on. There's enough for every single person, man or woman, depending on age, wherever they're from, ethnicity, culture, color. God's got enough fire, Holy Ghost fire, individual Holy Ghost fire for everybody. And John 3 says that God gives the Spirit without limit. I love that. God can give you his Holy Ghost without limit. There ain't no limit. There's not like, oh, I've reached 100% Holy Ghost. It's like, man, there ain't no limit to God. He'll give you the spirit without limit. <clears throat> Come on. Verse 5. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus in Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, these guys had too much wine. They had too much wine. I have it right here in my, in my Bible. I circled Arabs. They said he came to, uh, they were talking Arabic. Ain't that crazy? Almost like Jesus, like trying to prepare them. Don't follow Islam. Don't follow Islam, my Arabic friends. I'm proclaiming to you the wonders of God even in your own language. So it's crazy. God used this festival where they all come together. The, uh, they all come together to Pentecost. And they all come there for the different nations hearing the word, or coming, you know, to do their thing. For the Lord, and then boom, God busts forth with the Holy Ghost in power, starts speaking other tongues, and we're got to see a great harvest come through. Amen. Then Peter stood up. Come on. Some of y'all gotta stand up. Some of y'all gotta stand up and preach the word. Some of you gotta stand up on your job and your family with your friends and the and the neighborhoods and the nation where you're at. You need to stand up. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, come on, and addressed crowd fellow jews and all of you who live in jerusalem let me explain this to you listen carefully to what i say these people are not drunk as you suppose it's only nine in the morning no this is what was spoken by the prophet joel again peter's going to use the old testament scriptures Come on, don't ever say they didn't have the scriptures. That's what they're going off of. They're filled with the Holy Ghost. The, and the Holy Ghost leading them to the scriptures. What does Jesus say when he's talking about sending the Holy Ghost? That the Holy Spirit will remind you of everything that I've told you. What's everything Jesus has told mankind? The Word of God. He said he will remind you of everything I've ever told you. 
Okay, you got to get in the word of God and then Jesus can or the Holy Ghost can remind you of Jesus's word. If you don't know it, he can't remind you of something you don't know. Does that make sense? If I don't know a math problem from whatever, you know, I don't remember a math problem from I just took a statistics class. I don't remember the formulas. God can't remind me of something I've never known or I didn't really learn. Does that make sense? Okay, you don't know the scriptures. God can't or the Holy Ghost can't remind you of them because you don't know them. Get in the scriptures. Jesus will remind you of them. Uh, through the power of the Holy Ghost. And also, what does he say? He says, don't, don't be concerned with what you're going to say when you come before kings and rulers and stuff like that. The Holy Ghost will tell you what to say. See, you got to step up. In Psalms, it was our sister Maria Slattery from MPI uh, Chicago who taught me this, or who, who just brought it to my attention. In the book of Psalms, where it says, the Lord delivered you, out of, delivered you all out of Egypt, open up your mouth and I will fill it. See, you got to open up your mouth. You got to open up your mouth to preach the gospel. I can tell you the hardest part about preaching the gospel is the first couple words. It's getting up there, standing up, opening your mouth, and once you start going with the Holy Ghost, He's going to lead you. He tells you what to say. He tells me what to say. I love preaching the gospel. I feel so close to Christ. I feel close to Him. I feel close to Him when I read His Word, when I pray, when I worship. It's another thing, though, when I'm preaching the Word and I feel the Holy Ghost tell me, say this. Say that to them. React like this. Because he says, open your mouth and I will fill it. I take that step of faith and he starts to fill my mouth. The first couple words are usually the hardest. You feel the nerves and you feel the flesh come in. But once you start saying, hey, I'm here to share the good news about Jesus and the Holy Ghost. Uh, you start flowing in the Holy Ghost. And I'm telling you, then, then, then it's just fire and power coming out. But it's those first couple moments where you got to get over yourself. You got to deny yourself and just start preaching the word of God. And my goodness, God will take over. He will remind you of everything I've said. He will be with you even when you witness before rulers and kings like that. So be encouraged. Open your mouth and God will fill it. And this is what Peter did. He stood up, opened his mouth. He used to be scared to open his mouth even to, it says, even to a little... Um, uh, servant girls, right? He starts cursing and calls them cursing, denying Christ. Even to a little girl, imagine my 13 year old daughter comes up to you and says, Hey, you, you believe in Jesus? And you start like getting all crazy. You start cussing or something like that. Like, I don't believe in Jesus. What's wrong with you? It's like, man, that was a little girl. She's like 15, 16 years old. You can't even tell her about Jesus. Okay, so this same man, Peter, who was scared like that, denied Christ, is filled with the Holy Ghost now, stands up, addresses the crowd. I want to share this quick testimony. Me and my wife went to, um, um, oh man, I forgot the movie name. But we went to this movie. It was quote unquote Christian, right? Because um, we went to the movie. It was me and her went to movie theater to see it, and it was about like some Roman Catholic priest, and uh, he went to some Eastern nation. I don't remember where. Viet, forgive me if I'm wrong. Vietnam, or I think, or Cambodia, or something like that. But anyways, so he gets persecuted multiple times, and he ends up cracking and uh, becomes, uh, I think, it was Buddhist or whatever, whatever they're you know, state religion is, gives into it. And then, um, in the end of the movie, it shows his death and there's burial. They don't, well, they don't bury him. They just burn him alive. I think they, no, not burn, alive. He wasn't alive. They burned his body. Okay. After he died. And then like in his hand, his hand comes out like this and you see like a little cross, like a little necklace, a little wooden piece of cross that he had. And I, and it's almost insinuating like, yeah, even though, um, he became another religion and it gets to the point where he's even helping this false religion turning Christians like oh he'll help the mission he'll help the I think it was the Buddhists or the whatever wicked people they were to help find um Christian missionaries where they smuggle in Bibles and things along those lines he's helping the enemy okay and then the end he falls with a little cross in his hand or dies with a little cross and oh he must have been a Christian the whole time he really loved Jesus he just helped kill a bunch or persecute a bunch of saints and I'm like what this is the end of the movie. So I get up and I address the crowd and I said this man was not a Christian if that happened like that the Bible says if you don't love your brothers and sisters who you can see, you can't love God who you can't see. And I started preaching and felt the Holy Ghost fire. And a bunch of people leave. And actually, there was only three people at the end who stayed, three young guys. They were in the front. So I walked down to them. I keep preaching to them. And, and, and then I was like, man, you guys want to receive Jesus? You want to repent, you know, come to Christ, repent of your sins? And they go, man, we're all saved. And I'm like, for real? You know, they're like, yeah, we're saved. We go to Moody Bible College. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, praise God. And then they go, man, but we never heard nobody preach like that. And I go, man, that's because I'm filled with the Holy Ghost in power. Do you want that? I'll lay my hands on you and pray for you to receive that baptism of the Holy Ghost. And they basically said, ah, you know, I don't, I don't, we don't believe in that stuff. And I'm like, my goodness, you just saw the Holy Ghost power. And then they'll be, I don't want it because it doesn't go along with uh, uh, things I taught. And I love them, but I'm just saying, my goodness, saints, is it no wonder that so many are, are, are just so just so soft when it comes to preaching the gospel and scared of the world. 
They're not even filled with the Holy Ghost. I think my Pastor Troy was talking about how, uh, I think it was your uncle, brother, that um, once he got filled with the Holy Ghost, like, man, he felt that power to overcome. Amen. And in Christ, you overcome. But, man, he, he had to get that Holy Ghost unction, that Holy Ghost, boom, that Holy Ghost dynamite to go do what Jesus come to and to live holy. So we got that power. Let us use that power to preach the gospel to the whole world and be able and be ready to stand at any time. I'm not saying you have to go to every movie theater and stand up and do that. But, man, pray. God, leave me here. Man, I go to I go to McDonald's and I give out tracks. I went to McDonald's a couple of days ago. <clears throat> and uh, my wife was my wife and kids were with me. And as soon as I gave them a track, or maybe not soon, as soon after that, we heard him talking to somebody else. And he goes, oh, I'm an atheist, though. And he's because I tell him, I'm like, I give the guys tracks. Because when, when people are serving you and you go to restaurants and stuff like that, it's a great place to give tracks. They're in a position to serve. It's kind of humbling. So even if they might not have taken them outside, they might take it there because it's they're trying to serve you and be nice. So anyways, that's what I, I typically do. And then he starts saying, I'm an atheist. And the guy goes, what are you talking about? So they got to start talking about Jesus. I was at Starbucks a couple of days ago, and I gave out some tracks. And, and then I heard the workers say, oh, evangel evangelical Christian something. And I don't think it was good. And I wanted to get up there and witness, but I felt the Lord say, just calm down, let him talk about it. So I did. And uh, but I mean, even tracks, God's word does it. But that, that's power of the Holy Ghost. I'm bold. I'm ready to go anywhere. I don't stand up everywhere to do it, but I always got a track. And now I got a word to share. Let me pray for you. Let me lay hands on you and things like that. I'll step out in faith to heal people. Many times I'll step out in faith to heal someone. They don't get healed, but at least it opens up their heart to hear the word of God. Okay. For me saying that I was at that same Starbucks, there was a homosexual guy there. And he was crippled, like his hand was crippled. <clears throat> I wish I could say that he got healed, but he didn't. But I, I at least said, hey, man, he helped me out with my computer because I saw that his was working and mine wasn't. I couldn't connect to the Internet there. And he came over. I'm like, hey, man, what happened to you? And then we started talking. I said, what happened to your hand? He's like, oh, man, it's crippled, you know. Or, oh, he had an accident, I think, when he was young from that. And, and be, he became crippled. And I said, man, let me pray for you. And he said, of course. And I prayed to God, heal him. He didn't get prayed, healed instantly. But then I got to witness him. I said, hey, man, you're a homosexual. You know, he had his rainbow bracelet. And he goes, yeah, you know, basically God loves me like that. I'm like, yeah, God does love you, man, but it's sin, you know. There's only one way through Jesus. And I told him, tell someone about my brother, Juan, who probably listened to this brother. Uh, and, and, and uh, man, Juan, my brother's testimony, uh, and Sadia and all them, will smack you in the face. Because if, if you're a bank robber, or you're a murderer, or you're a drug dealer, and you say, I got saved, even the sinner will be like, well, I'm glad you guys became a Christian and found your happiness, right? But when a homosexual gets saved, it's like a slap in their face because they all love it. But anyways, that guy was... Uh, I don't know if it's the right word to be saying courage, but at least I was able to witness to him, love him, and tell him the truth. So just be able to step up in faith. It doesn't always have to be a great sermon and thousands of people get saved. I, I do it a lot just with one person or going to the store and things like that. But be ready to be like Peter, to stand up and raise your voice. Amen? Uh, let's keep going to verse 16. No, this was... This is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I'll pour out my spirit on all people. Come on, say all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I'll pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. To, begin, to prophesy is to give instruction, to give some kind of authoritative word, okay? We're not saying that we're not writing scriptures again. Are we saying that, like, I'm going to write uh, Third Timothy? I'm not saying that. I'm not saying I'm going to write the third book of Peter, all right, we're just saying we're we're giving prophecies, words from the Lord, and they coincide. They don't go against the word of God. All right, so that's what we're saying to our friends who are going to give us a hard time. And then if you're going to say a prophet is a man of God and gives authoritative word, how come it says sons and daughters will prophesy? So it says females will prophesy. If a female is prophesying and gives a prophetic word, is she not given? Is she not in somehow being authoritative or leading or teaching even men who are listening to that word? Come on now, stop saying women can't be ministered. It even says the woman will be prophesying. To prophesy, you're teaching. You, they, you tell me she only prophesies only to women. Why didn't Joel uh, differentiate and why didn't Peter get that? Come on. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on earth below. The sun will be, excuse me, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And Everyone, come on, and only the elect, no, and everyone, come on, who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Peter preaching, Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible 
for death to keep his hold on him. David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest in hope because you will not abandon me to the realm of death. You will not let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy and your presence. Peter, who was scared to even testify that he knows Christ to a little servant girl is filled with the Holy Ghost. He's witnessing to the man who literally helped crucify Christ. And what does he do? He shows them they're condemned. You nailed him to the cross. And you can preach that now. You can say, you know, you nailed Christ to the cross. I know you literally weren't there physically, but it's because of your sins, my friend, that Christ was nailed to the cross. It was because of your sins that Christ hung there on the cross. Put your faith, repent, and put your faith in him, because after he died, he didn't stay that he rose again, and he's going to judge the world, my friends. Peter going in verse 29, fellow Israelites, Peter loves them. He's, I love you guys, fellow Israelites. You know, I just rebuked y'all. I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew <clears throat> that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see the decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. Come on, has God raised Jesus to life? Yes or no? Yes, you should be a witness to him. Has God now also raised you to life because of Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, and faith in Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Ghost? Has he not raised you to life? Now you are called to be his witness to all the nations, to everywhere. And see, sometimes I think in our circles, we understand that. Like, yeah, I'm called to this nation. I'm called to this neighborhood. I'm called to this. Praise God. But what I feel like a lot of us don't do is, are you called to your family and friends? You are. Understand that. You are also called to your family and friends. This power to preach is also to your family at Thanksgiving that's coming up, right? It's also to your family at the, at uh, Christmas that's coming up. It's also to your friends on Facebook and, and on social media. It's to your friends and family. I've noticed it's harder to preach to your family and friends because they know you. They know many of the sins you've done. And even Jesus says... Uh, um, a man's own enemies will be the members of his own household and a prophet is not even honored in his own hometown. So you get almost sometimes less honor at home. And I get it. But God will give you power to preach. <laughs> Listen to me. Before I got saved, I was scared to preach publicly. Okay? I remember a uh, Bible study, the first uh, MPI Dallas, uh, excuse me, <laughs> MPI Chicago Bible study that uh, I was a part of was Pastor Berto and his wife Griselda, and uh, it was just called Bible study. Then I don't think it, it was a Gavea Bible study. It wasn't called the uh, um, uh, the gathering. But, um, but as they did back then, almost a decade ago, like I got saved June 2013. As they did back then, till this day, they go out preaching before Bible study, and um, <laughs> at that specific time, I laughed because I'm just thinking about it. They were going out preaching. We were going out preaching to uh, a park like half a block away from Bertel's house. And it's like literally like moms and kids and dads. And I was scared to preach. And I would listen to me. I would go late on purpose, even though I got out on work early and I could have been there in time to preach. I would go late on purpose because I did not want to witness. I was scared. And I was already saved, okay? I was living holy. But then listen to me. And Pastor Joe's office when Nancy, Pastor Nancy, Pastor Bertel and Pastor uh, uh, Jared laid their hands on me, and I started speaking in tongues. After that, I was not scared to go preach boldly. And I didn't know this scripture. I didn't know that he says, when the Holy Ghost comes on you, you'll be my witnesses. I didn't know this. I didn't know this. Peter knew more than me. He had to hear that. So I, I wouldn't say I was as bad as Peter, like cussing and, and straight up denying him. But I was scared like Peter was. But then I got filled with the Holy Ghost and I got bold like Peter in the book of Acts chapter 2. Come on, get filled and be bold like the disciples in the book of Acts. Let's keep going. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven. And yet he said, the Lord said to my Lord, sit in my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. He indicts them. He puts an indictment on him. You crucified him. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. Come on, the word of God cuts. And said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, 
What shall we do? Peter replied, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all, come on, who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. You save this promise, the gift of the Holy Ghost is for you. And for those cultish people who say, do you have to get baptized because Jesus, uh, Peter said it right here. How come, I just, a little side note, how come in the next chapter, chapter 3, verse 19, Peter doesn't mention baptism. He says, repent. And turn to God that your sins might be wiped out. Okay? If baptism needs to be sa if saved you, why doesn't it Peter say it in the next chapter? See, they love Acts 2.38, but they don't, they don't look at Acts 3.19. Okay? Just saying. Anyways, there's a little side note. Verse 40. With many other words, come on, he warned them and pleaded with them, <coughs> save yourself from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Come on. Let's believe God. Let's believe God for a big harvest. That we've, many of us have seen men, men, much uh, trouble and people hating us and even some persecution. But let's also believe for that big harvest. Jesus promised 100 times more blessing, but 100 times more persecution in this age. Receive it all. Come on. Let's go to this fa famous last little passage in Acts 2 and then we're done. We'll pray. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. Come on. Filled with all the many signs and wonders devote, uh, uh, performed by the apostles. And it says they were devoted to the apostles' teachings. What are the apostles' teachings? Right here. The word of God and your leaders. Listen to their teachings. To be devoted to fellowship. Be devoted to eating together, breaking the bread, and to prayer. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. I'll close out with this thought and we'll pray. If this seems too much, oh man, you know, my church asked me to, you know, go witness on the streets and Bible study and discipleship and service, you know, let's just say 12 hours a week. Okay, you would not have made it with these brothers. These brothers are meeting all the time. It says every day. I'm not saying every one of them met every day, but they was meeting every day. They was preaching, doing the thing, living for Jesus. That was their life. It wasn't some side thing like I got soccer and my job and this. No, it was Jesus and, and the ministry of my family right here. We did, they did everything together right here, it says. And again, I'm not saying everybody did everything, but the church was doing the thing. They were always doing the thing. It wasn't a side issue. It was the main issue, my friend. You've been saved to preach the gospel and to make disciples of all the nations. That is the main issue for all Christians. Come on, let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word, oh God. I thank you for your spirit, God. I pray that all of us will be filled with the Holy Ghost and power and get a fresh fire to preach your gospel to the world, to make disciples of all the nations, God. Be with us as we go through uh, uh, ministry college, and may we not be like Jonah going the other way, but maybe it would be like Peter, uh, excuse me, like Peter preaching in the beginning and then like how Paul, when he said, even to now, I'm getting poured out as a drink offering. I'm finishing the race. So I pray that all of us would finish the race in Jesus' name. God bless y'all. Thank you for listening. Be encouraged. I love you guys. Take care.